So crystal and solids have regular repeating patterns. What are those patterns? Um, we refer to the crystal lattice, that's the regular arrangement of atoms. And the particular crystal lattice that a, a compound or an element or whatever has is uh, dependent on the energy. The particles are going to um, arrange in a way to minimize their energy. So when we look at a crystal lattice, here we're looking at a, a two-dimensional lattice, and I don't know about you, but lattice reminds me of a garden lattice, right? A kind of a, a trellis thing that you might put for your plants to grow up, right? And there are points here where the, the slats intersect. Those are the lattice points, and in this, the lattice points are where the atoms are. Could be ions, could be molecules. If we look at the pattern of this, we identify the unit cell. The unit cell is the smallest piece of this that we can repeat over and over again and get the whole crystal. So that's going to be this dark red square here. If I take this dark red square and I replicate it to the right and to the bottom and over and I just keep making this over and over again, I get this whole pattern. The unit cell starts in the center of four of these circles. And that's not necessarily something obvious that you would think of. You might think of trying to, you know, we'll take, in, include whole atoms, but then you run into a problem and it's just not going to work out that way. This is the smallest unit that reproduces the entire crystal. Um, you can look at this, look at the bathroom floor, the tiles in bathroom floors, and um, some of them have patterns, and you can see that in, it looks like they're little teeny tiny tiles that someone very painstakingly laid out, but actually those little tiles come in big squares already put together, right? And so here's one big square, and one big square, and one big square, and, and that's kind of the idea of this unit cell. <coughs> So there are seven fundamental types of unit cells. We're going to talk about one of them mostly and just barely talk about another one. So the cubic unit cell is the one we're interested in. <coughs> it's the most straightforward. Cubic, as the name suggests, all the edge lengths are the same and the angles are 90 degrees, like a cube. So here the unit cell is a cube. These other variations have different angles, different relative edge lengths. The only other one we'll be mentioning is this hexagonal one. When we're drawing out these unit cells, um, all of the atoms are identical. We're gonna use two different colors, purple and gold, just to visualize what's going on but they represent the same kind of atom. So two things that we measure about crystal structures, one is the coordination number, and that refers to how many atoms are in direct contact with a given atom. How many close neighbors does it have with one, one atom in, in a unit cell? And then the other thing we look at is packing efficiency. And so that's how much of the cell is occupied by the spheres or the atoms as opposed to empty space. These go together. If we have a higher coordination number, we'll see a greater packing efficiency. So here's a table summarizing um, three cubic cells, uh, the simple cubic, body-centered cubic, and face-centered cubic. And we'll talk about each of these individually. So in the simple cubic unit cell, um, this, the face here looks like that unit cell from, no, I take that back, it doesn't, Never mind. Start over. Um, here we have, these are so hard to describe. There it is, look at it. <laughs> I don't know what to say about it. Um, 
in this simple cubic cell, uh, the, the atoms touch along the sides of the, of the cube. Um, if we use R to indicate the radius of an atom, then the edge length is two radii, right? Because here's one radius and another. So the edge length is two times R, whatever the radius of the atom is. Each of, <clears throat> each of these corners is one eighth of an atom. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight times one eighth. So in this is a total of one atom. It's parts of eight different atoms. But if we took this apart and stuck these pieces together, they'd make one sphere. Does that make sense? Th this is the one cell that I want you to understand. The others are kind of kind of weird, but if you understand this one, you'll just say, oh, well, it's kind of like that. Anybody have any questions about this one? You have a question, but it's not coming into words, right? So if we were packing oranges in a box, the oranges on the bottom layer would be lining up like this. And then the next layer that we put would be right on top of these. And that's what's gonna give this type of a cubic unit cell, where this atom is directly above that atom. It is not the most efficient way to pack things in. Well, this is the unit cell. And so if I take this and put another one next to it, then you'll see now I've got a fourth of this atom, and I stick one over here, and one up there, and one over here. So maybe this picture will help. So here is the unit cell showing all the, ad the entire atoms, okay? So this is the part that we're repeating over and over again. And so we take this and we move it over and over and over and over again. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, so, so this is the unit cell, the piece that's reproduced to make the entire pattern. Um, each of these corners is one eighth of one of these atoms. So we say that there's one atom in the cell. It's not, it's the equivalent of one atom. So it's parts of eight different atoms, but they add up to be one atom in the unit cell. So this unit cell, we, if we know the um, radius of the atom, we can calculate the volume of the unit cell, we can calculate the volume of an atom, and then we can find out what part, what percentage is occupied by the atom and what percentage is empty space. Because there's, there's some empty space in here. You can't pack circles together without any space. So the coordination number idea here is if I look at one of these um, at atoms, I'm gonna see, well, how many other atoms is it actually touching? So it's touching this one and it's touching this one. These two are these guys right here, this one and this one. They're touching each other along the edge there. Those are touching, it's touching one over here, one above, one in front, and one below. So it's actually touching six other atoms. One, two, three, four, five, six. This guy in the middle. So if we're looking at this as that guy in the middle, then this would be the one I'm calling number one, and this is the num one I'm calling number three, and number two is the guy in the back. They're touching each other at a point. This atom is not directly touching any of these other atoms, right? It's touching six neighbors. Find the 
for simple cubic unit cell, it's always six. Yeah. And so um, the idea here is that not that you memorize packing efficiencies or anything, but that you get the idea that the more atoms that are in direct contact, the higher the packing efficiency, the closer things have to be together. What's holding the crystal together? Well, that depends on what kind of a solid it is, right? But there's got to be some sort of attractive force between these. If it's an atomic solid, it's just dispersion forces. But dispersion forces operate at short distances, and so they only really are significant between two atoms that get really close to each other, touchingly close. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, I don't really understand how you would well, one, figure out the coordination number, mm -hmm. which ones touch each other. Okay. So this is a three-dimensional picture on a two-dimensional screen. And so you have to visualize it a little. It's like those images that you can you kind of flip-flop, right? Sometimes you see it and sometimes you can't. Um, so if I think about this sphere right here, maybe it's easier to look at these guys. Is this directly touching this neighbor? They're, they're touching. You see the balls are right next to each other. So here's the one I circled. And this is the one in the other picture that I labeled number three. And then this one is also touching the one directly above it. That's the one I labeled number one. Is it directly touching this one up in this corner? No. It's near it, but there's this gap in between. So that's not directly touching. Okay? And then there's one more in this illustration that it's touching, and that's the one right in the back. Okay, so along the edges of that cube, they're touching. Any other questions? It's a way of looking at a three-dimensional thing that you've probably never done before. Calculate the packing efficiency of the two-dimensional lattice shown here. So. We'll look at calculating packing efficiency using two dimensions instead of three because it's just a little bit simpler. So packing efficiency, we're interested in here, not volume, but area. We're looking at the area of the circles divided by the area of the unit cell times 100. So here in white is the unit cell, and we see that some of this area is occupied by the purple circles, but there's this part in the middle that's empty, right, that's white. So packing efficiency, the part over the whole times 100, so the part that's occupied by the circles divided by the part, the whole thing, divided by the whole thing. So can we calculate the area of the unit cell? I'll, I'll draw it a little bigger over here. If we say that the radius of an atom is R, then the edge length is 2 times R. Everybody okay with that? And then area is length times width, right? But here the length and the width are the same thing. So that's L times L. So that's going to be 2R squared, which would be 4R squared. So I can plug that in up here. The area of the unit cell is 4R squared. Then I need to know what area is occupied by the circles as opposed to empty. If I took these four shapes here 
and was able to move them around, could I put them together to make one circle? Yeah. If I took this one and stuck it up here and put this one over here and that one over there, I could make a circle. That makes sense? Okay. So how many circles are in that square? One. There's four quarters of circles, so one, one circle. So what's the area of a circle? Pi r squared? So the area of one circle is pi r squared. The area of the square itself is 4r squared and times 100. Well, what happens to the r squareds? They cancel out. How convenient. It's always going to work out that way. So we've got 4 divided by pi. You have a pi, I'm sorry, pi divided by 4. You have a pi button on your calculator, use it. Do not abbreviate pi as 3.14. Okay, just use the pi button. Pi divided by 4 times 100 to make a percentage, and I get 78.5%. So in the unit cell, 78.5% of the area is covered with purple, and the other per, uh, 100 minus 78 is, is empty. Does that make sense? This is what we're talking about, except we're talking about it in three dimensions. Any questions? Seventy-eight point five percent. So the next unit cell is called the body-centered cubic unit cell, and this one looks like that simple cubic, but we've pulled the corners apart and we've stuck an entire atom in the middle of it. You see that this gold atom is stuck in the middle, and that's going to push the rest of these a little bit away from each other. So this is the body in the center. Now calculating the edge length in terms of r becomes more complicated. The geometry is all there if you're interested. Um, it comes down to l equals 4r over the square root of 3. And again, you don't have to memorize that. looking at this in a couple of other ways. So here's that cubic unit cell. Here's if we fill out the corner atoms, so we see the whole sphere. And then over here, we're pulling everything apart a little bit so that we can try to figure out how many atoms is this one actually touching. In this situation, the central atom here, the one in the, the body in the center, is actually touching directly each of the ones on the corners, right? So that's eight, eight atoms that it's touching. So the coordination number is eight. Um, if you can see it in there, great, that's tough. The packing efficiency here goes up to 68%. Any questions? I did this problem yesterday. I didn't think it was helpful, so I'm going to skip it. Um, an atom has a radius of 138 picometers, crystallizes in the body center cubic unit cell. What's the volume of the unit cell in cubic centimeters? So all of these unit cells are cubes, right? and they have an edge length. This one, um, body-centered cubic, you go and you look it up right there. L is 4R over the square root of 3. 
L equals 4R over the square root of 3, just from geometry. So what you've got going on here is you've got an atom at each corner, and then you've got one in the middle. And it's just super hard to draw. You shouldn't even try. So radius of 138 picometers, well, that's what R is. R is the radius of an atom. And they're saying, what's the volume of the cell? Well, the volume of a cube is the edge length cubed, right? So the volume is L cubed, and we know that L is 4R over the square root of 3. So we'll take that and cube it. We can think ahead a little bit and make things easier on ourselves. It's asking for cubic centimeters. We learned how to convert squared and cubed units at the beginning. Um, most students don't really enjoy doing that. Um, so what we can do here to avoid that is we can convert picometers to centimeters before we cube it, right? So 138 picometers, do you remember what pico stands for? 12, 10 to the negative 12. Nano, nano, 10 to the minus nine, right? Pico's the next one, and they go by threes, so it's minus 12. So I can convert this to meters by just writing 138 times 10 to the minus 12 meters, because this is what pico stands for. So I'm just subbing in what pico stands for, and then I'll add a factor to convert to centimeters, meters on top. Centi stands for 10 to the minus two. One centimeter is one times 10 to the minus two meters. These metric unit conversions are not gonna go away. So you do this on your calculator and you come up with 1.38 times 10 to the minus eight centimeters. So I can plug that into my equation here, four times 1.38 times 10 to the minus eight centimeters divided by the square root of three, the whole thing cubed. On my TI-36X Pro, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take four times 1.38 E E minus eight divide by I'm going to do square root of three and we're going to press equals and then I'm going to do the X to the box button and put in three for the exponent and I'm going to get three point two four times ten to the minus twenty three. The volume of the unit cell. Different calculators use different logic systems and so you need to know how your calculator thinks. If you have trouble please ask me during lab I'd be happy to help you. Any questions? Oops, I did that one. There's the answer. Okay. The third cubic unit cell we're gonna look at is called the face-centered. So these purple ones were our original cubic unit cell when they were all close together. Now we're pushing them apart and making room for an atom on each face of the cube. I realize I just, I forgot something about the body-centered. Let's go back and talk about that for a minute. How many atoms are in this body-centered cubic unit cell? The, the equivalent of how many full atoms? Well, there's one in the middle, the gold one is clearly inside the unit cell. And then the purple ones, each of those corners is one-eighth of an atom. 
and there's eight of them. So there's two atoms, the equivalent of two atoms in the unit cell, okay? It's parts of eight and then the whole one, but they add up to the volume of two atoms. So back to the face centered. Now we've got, this is half of an atom on this face and half on that face and half on this face. So this one has more actual volume of atom inside of it. I don't know what happened to this graphic. Um, I, I copied that from the publisher's provided slides and it's missing some things. Um, L is equal to two times the square root of two times R for this one. On this cell, we have atoms touching diagonally along a face. And so it's a little bit simpler, but still kind of messy to figure out what L is in terms of the radius of an atom. Looking at these three different views, <coughs> counting up how many atoms do we have in here? Well, the purple ones, that's one eighth each of eight different atoms, so that adds up to one atom of purple. And then on the face, we have half of an atom. And the cube has six faces, right? We can see three of them here, one, two, three. Then there's three behind that we can't see. So that's a total of three atoms from the yellow ones, right? So a total of four atoms in the unit cell. Um, coordination number here gets difficult to look at. It's really hard to look at. Um, I'm okay with uh, just believing them when they say 12. Because these yellow ones are touching each other and they're touching purple ones and they tried to draw it out here, but that one doesn't help me at all. And then the packing efficiency here is again a little higher than for the previous one. L was two times the square root of two R. Like that. There typically are problems involving unit cells like this on the ACS exam. And this is an important concept that's used in some future classes. Not necessarily chemistry, but I know geologists need to be aware of things like this and engineers probably do too. Um, <clears throat> On the ACS exam, they're not going to ask you to calculate edge lengths or anything, but they may ask you how many atoms are in a unit cell, and they'll, they'll give you the picture, and you have to be able to understand what you're looking at and count them up. Density is related to crystal structure. Chromium crystallizes with a body-centered cubic unit cell. The radius of a chromium atom is 125 picometers. Calculate the density of solid crystalline chromium in grams per cubic centimeter. So this is pulling in some old stuff. What's density? Mass over volume, right? So if we want the density of this, we need to find the mass of it and divide by its volume. The density doesn't matter how much stuff we have, so we can choose the amount of, of chromium we're gonna look at to calculate mass and volume. What's simplest here is to choose one unit cell worth. What's a little tricky about this problem um, is that it comes after having just talked about, see I almost did it again, face centered. Um, but it's actually the body centered. So this is me trying to draw that this is one thing in the middle there, not on the face.
there. I'll, I'll show you what the face would look like, just for contrast, I guess. The face would have this complete circle, and then these would be touching it along that, like that. And so we see there's this diagonal where they're touching each other. This would be um, face-centered, and this is body-centered. So on this one, they're touching diagonally from one corner to the diagonal corner of the cube. In the body, um, nothing is touching along this face. They're touching diagonally through. So do you actually have to understand the details of these different unit cells to do this problem? No, you don't. You need to recognize body-centered and choose the correct edge length formula. That's, that's the important thing here. We want to use this one. because it's body-centered. In the body-centered cubic unit cell, how many atoms were there? Two. So there's the one in the middle. Let's go back and look at the picture. That's the most, this one. So there's this one in the middle. And then parts of eight atoms. So if we took this diagram here and could pull it apart and reassemble the purple ones, they would make one purple sphere. You okay with that? So I have the equivalent of two full atoms inside the unit cell. You okay with that? Two atoms. So I've got two atoms in my cell, and I have a relationship here that I can calculate the edge length and then the volume. Can I calculate the mass of two atoms of chromium? Yeah. Let's do that one first. So two atoms of chromium. Well, what I've got on the periodic table is the mass of a mole of chromium atoms, right? So I need to convert from atoms to moles. And that brings back our friend Avogadro's number. So atoms cancel out. And then what's the mass in grams of a mole of chromium? on the periodic table, right? Mm, 51.996. The moles cancel out. And so that's going to give me the mass of this cube. 2 divided by 6.022 EE23 times 51.996. One point seven two six eight six times ten to the minus twenty two grams. Didn't space that out very well. So that's the mass. There's only two atoms in the unit cell. It should be a really, really small number, right? So now for the volume. Well, I'm, I'm told what R is. The radius of the chromium atom is 125 picometers. And again, if we think ahead to what units we're trying to get to, we want cubic centimeters, not cubic picometers. 
So it's best to convert this to centimeters before we do anything else to it. That's equal to 125 times 10 to the minus 12 meters, and then convert to centimeters. So that's going to come out to 1.25 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So I can plug that into my volume equation. Volume is L cubed, which is 4R over the square root of 3 cubed. So I've got 4 times 1.25 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters divided by the square root of 3, and that whole thing is cubed. So 2.4056 times 10 to the minus, oops, 23 cubic centimeters. That's the volume. So I'm going to put that up here. And then I'm going to divide, and I'm going to come up with 7.18 grams over cubic centimeters. seems almost magical to me that you take those really ugly small numbers and then you come up with a number like seven. Is that a reasonable density for a metal? Yeah. Hey Siri, what's the density of chromium? The density of chromium is about 7.14 grams per cubic centimeter. Pretty close. Siri says 7.14. We got 7.18. Any questions? Yeah. This one's two. Okay, that's a good question. Why is the face centered eight atoms? I think this picture is the best one. Whoops. So, um, the, the purple here is just like in the previous ones. Those purple pieces add up to one atom. You okay with that? Yeah, I get the one eighth, so the one half. So on here, on one side of the cube is half of an atom. And on the top face is half of an atom. And on the, this side is half an atom. Oh, there's six sides. And there's six sides. Yeah. So that comes to a total of three. So if I took these pieces and reassembled them, I could make three gold spheres and one purple sphere, okay? So it's the equivalent of four atoms in a unit cell. Any other questions? Right. The body centered is like we've stuck a whole atom inside of the simple cubic. So these corners get pushed out a little bit, but the one in the middle there is the whole atom sitting inside of the unit cell. Yep. Um, an instructor was telling me that uh, he likes to do a demonstration, which is seven the, I just haven't done it yet. Um, you take 
oranges and toothpicks. And you make this arrangement and then you take a knife and you cut them and you can get this, these unit cells. Sounds messy. Could be cool, it sounds messy. I just haven't gotten around to, to doing anything like that yet. Okay, so since we just talked about this, how many atoms are in the unit cell in the face-centered cubic structure? Four. Very good. It's almost like I paid her to ask me that question. So a question like this is a very reasonable exam question. There are three unit cells. Their names are very suggestive of their structures. Body centered, there's a body in the center. Face centered, we have atoms centered on each face. And so we need to be able to picture this in our minds and count up the number of atoms. I don't really have this memorized, oh, there's four. I can picture the structure and put it together quickly that there's four, okay? So we can look at these structures in a different way, constructing them as layers of spheres. So we're gonna look at some of the same shapes for the unit cell, but we're thinking about it in a different way. And this might be a little more intuitive. If we think about these spheres and, I don't know, oranges. They're, they're not orange, but oranges. If you're trying to put oranges in a box, Right, there's different ways you could get the oranges to pack in there. And some ways you're going to get more oranges in the box than other ways. But in this structure, the oranges down here are lined up in a square pattern. I wonder if that would work. never done that before. Oh, that's kind of fun. So they're they're lining up in rows. Okay. The second row, the second layer is sitting directly on top. That is not how spheres naturally want to go into a box. Right? You can imagine you try to put this uh, orange directly on top of another orange. It doesn't want to sit there. It wants to hold, fall into this little indentation between the four oranges. Right? but we're gonna make it stay up there. And so the second layer, these spheres are directly above the ones below, and the third layer is the same. You okay with this? This is gonna give us that simple cubic unit cell. There's a lot of empty space here. Packing fruit is a big business in Reedley where I live, and um, they don't pack fruit like this. Too much empty space. You want as much fruit as possible into the box, right? You don't want a lot of empty space. So this is not how you pack things together. But some crystals take on this shape, not because it's the most compact, but because it is the lowest energy for them. It's more efficient in packing oranges or spheres if you offset the individual rows by half of an orange or half of a half of a purple maybe these are plums that might be better these are plums um, so now these are offset from each other but they get closer together right okay with that what we're looking at now is closest packed structures closest ways that you can pack spheres and we're gonna look at two situations. 
So here's layer A. And then layer B, we're trying to pack these close together. So we're not going to stick layer B directly on top of layer A because that's going to leave a lot of empty space. We're going to let this slide over so that this um, B here is sitting in the indentation from the layer below. Does that make sense? This is what spheres naturally want to do. So we've got layer A and we've got layer B. And that's the basis of a closest pack structure. There's two variations. Um, and the difference is in how is the third layer arranged. So here's the first layer, the second layer. Then the third layer in um, what's called hexagonal closest packed, which is not a cubic unit cell. It's a hex hexagonal cell. This layer A, those spheres are directly above those in layer A. So these are directly above and they're offset from layer B. So this is an A, B, A, B pattern. And this gives us something that looks like this. Um, the smallest cell here is a hexagon. I'm, well, I'm sorry, this is, is a hexagonal unit and this is the individual unit cell. What makes this different is the angles are not 90 degrees. So this is the this is us talking about a hexagonal cell very very briefly. There it is, hexagonal cell. The other choice with that third layer um, here if you look at this I'll just mark it with an X, this guy. So here we've got this darker one in the front and up here we've got three but the darker one is in the back. And so this layer on top of this layer would be offset from each other. So layer A, the first layer and the third layer are not exactly the same. So this is an A, B, C pattern. And this is identical to the face-centered cubic unit cell structure. This requires some visualization. So A, B, C, A, four layers, put them together, tip it diagonally a bit, and then slice some stuff off, and hopefully we recognize this as the face center. How this all works into that, I don't expect that to be clear. I do hope that you would recognize, oh, that looks like that face centered thing, right? 